I'm pleased to um, open the stage for my CEO and founder, Wolfgang, um, who invented the technology um, on which the Coding Manda is based. Wolfgang is a uh, physicist and an engineer. He started the development of the Coding Manda in 2010. And uh, the first device was made available in 2016 on the market. And we're really happy to um, hand over to Wolfgang. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I will share my screen and give you a brief introduction. I will skip through the more, more the basic things, try to keep it short, as I assume most of you people might uh, know already about the at least basic things, please. Uh, I will try to keep more time for Q&A. Coliminder, the name Coliminder historically is coming from E. coli being our first target organisms. And so we stayed with the name. The machine or the technology is a fully automated online measurement of bacterial contamination in water. And the aim is to provide the microbial contamination or the microbial dimension of water quality as a process parameter. Because a process, in order to control something, you need to be able to measure it. Uh, if you have a process, you need to control the target parameters. Otherwise, the process is not efficient or not safe. And this is a main focus or a main future focus of our technology, but of course, all other rapid microbiology uh, methods as well. Because these parameters or these processes, there's a huge processes around the globe running without a direct process feedback on bacterial contamination. So that, that's the future potential of any of these technologies. The problem is known, the microbial uh, quality is very important and requires a manual lab method that needs up to five days to deliver a result. So Consequently, it's not available for process control. Uh, our solution, the Colimine, is able to provide this microbial dimension of water quality or bacterial contamination fully automatically and within 15 minutes. The 15 minutes are important, especially uh, in process control, because in order to be able to influence what's going on, you need to get a result or feedback within the process time. Otherwise, uh, process control is not feasible. Um, the key features of our technology are that it's fully automated. So it's not, it can be installed in the lab. There are customers that are using it in the lab, especially now, pharmaceutical industry, uh, uh, but also drinking water. Some bottling companies are using it in the lab as the first step for evaluation purposes. But the main, the main, most benefit can be gained from the technology if you install it some at some point, and then you monitor what's going on in your river, in your process, in your treatment plant, in order to learn and improve uh, the process, get it more safe and more efficient. So the machine, it can be installed and left alone, and it's fully automatically measuring, taking the sample in, doing the measurement, cleaning itself, calibrating itself. It takes 15 minutes from taking the sample into the final result, and this is followed by a cleaning step. And according or because we use the enzymatic measurement approach, our machines are able to measure specifically. And this is very important because the most important concept of water microbiology in general is the indicator organism concept. There are specific indicators and you find it in each water regulations. Uh, across the globe, you have fecal contamination as the main risk for human health. Therefore, you'd have need fecal indicators to measure uh, the level of fecal contamination, which corresponds with the risk. The second parameter for that uh, dimension or for the fecal contamination is enterococci. Uh, 
Um, this is antrum coca can be used in surface waters, but more more uh, likely it's used in lower contaminated waters if you want to go specifically to gain information about the level of fecal contamination. We have an, a third parameter, which is a bulk parameter for overall microbial activity, reflecting what is living in the water, all kinds of living organisms, not only bacteria, all types of bacteria, but also algae, yeast, mold, biofilm. All these things produce uh, a signal in total activity. We have a specific reagent for highly mineralized waters because a lot of our um, customers from bottling industry are using that parameter. The technology is mainly used in early warning, in process feedback, process control, especially uh, also in food and beverage industries, drinking water production and process control. So how, how does it work? What is the basics of the technology, the approach? Everybody is aware, I think, uh, of the standard methods, which is has been developed about 170 years ago um, using proliferation of microorganisms to make them visible. They are too small to see them in, in the sample itself. So the sample is brought into ideal conditions, filtered, brought into ideal conditions, growth media, and then those culturable organisms or groups of culturable organisms form visible colonies after a dedicated time, so it's agreed on a specific condition for the growth of the cells, and then after a specific time, these cells or the colonies are, are counted, and this count, the colony forming units, is the measure, is used as a comparable measure to measure this water quality. Of course, there is no way to uh, get a result in colony forming units or most probable number, if you go for IDEX, you can't get that from a rapid device because there's a, incu uh, an, a contradiction because between incubation and forming colonies and rapid. So there's another approach required. And with our technology, we choose a very basic approach, which is the energetic turnover or, or the metabolic activity of an organism. It's obvious that any cultural organism needs to be alive, but there is a more basic measure for life than being cultural. Yeah. This is having a metabolic activity. Having a metabolism means there's an energetic turnover. This organism is alive. And in all metabolic systems, enzymes are catalysts needed to make a metabolic system happen. And our measurement approach is based on a direct measurement of this enzymatic activity that, that is reflecting the metabolic activity of the target organisms. So what, what we do scientifically speaking, what the machine does in the course of the measurement process, it's performing a fully automated enzyme assay, a fluorogenic enzyme assay. And the fluorophore produced per time is a measure for the enzymatic activity present in the sample. So if we compare the results, the traditional method to produce colony forming units per volume as a result, as a measurable, comparable result of contamination, the enzymatic method produces after 15 minutes a result in enzymatic activity per volume, concentration of enzymes as a result. The good thing about the enzymes the enzymatic activity is that it is scientifically defined. It's a well-defined value. Or there is a definition for it. So 
you can calibrate any measurement to according to the scientific definition. So it's not an arbitrary unit. It's a real well-defined value. And this is a precondition for a future standard because you need independent methods to determine limits and you need independent methods to validate technologies. So technology independent validation of a measurement approach is an important precondition to be able to have different suppliers on the market offering the same method according to a standard. So this is a very important thing for the future. At the moment, it's more confusing because nobody knows what milli MFU or enzymatic activity means, but that, that takes some time and that will come. So to summarize, the standard method is based on cultivability or cell colonies formed per volume of sample. And the enzymatic method is based on life energy or energetic turnover of the living organisms per volume of sample. So we have the CFU on the one hand side and the enzymatic activity per volume on the other hand. I am not sure how much I used of my time because I forgot to start the clock. Can you I... already received a 10 minutes uh, set okay. of perfect. Okay. perfect. So that's perfect. And I'll open the stage for any questions and answers. If anyone wants to post a question into the chat, I'm happy to, to share that and address that. So in case there are no questions for the time being, you are more than invited to post your questions or write your questions into the chat a little bit later. But as there are no questions at the moment, I'm happy to hand over to Oliver Köster. Thank you very much for joining us, Oliver. Um, Oliver actually studied biology at the University of Zurich with a speci specialization into microbiology and limnology. Um, after several um, postdoc uh, um, uh, research and development uh, stays at the University of Zurich, he then changed to pharmaceutical industry as a team leader. And since 2003, he has been head of the biology section of the Zurich Waterworks or water supply and is responsible for the microbial monitoring of the drinking water supply and its sources. And I would like to add Oliver's mo probably most of the a one, the only experienced um, user of online monitoring techniques for the microbiological water quality. So um, happy to open the stage for you, Oliver. Yeah, I'm happy to <laughs> share a little bit of what I did, but can you see? It's, yeah, okay. Does it function? <laughs> yeah, so I uh, gave the name quick and dirty comparative test of colimine the beta D glucosidase activity assay kit and the IDEX enter alert test because uh, more than 10 years ago I tested the coligard, the, the, proto uh, the prototype, and um, I tested it uh, of E. coli and enzymatic activity, and I was not so happy with it at that time so i was wondering yeah is is this uh is this uh coli mind now able to have the same sensitivity as uh, the common uh, tests have and i couldn't believe it when wolfgang said this so I asked for a trial and uh, my goal was to test the sensitivity directly with the enter tests. As uh, Wolfgang said, normally it takes at least 24 hours to test enter -cocci. And this should now be possible with the Colliminder in 15 minutes. So, yeah. I couldn't believe that at the beginning, but I began with some testings 
And on the right side, you see water utility of um, the waterworks of Zurich. We have a groundwater plant. Uh, we have two lake water plants. And uh, on the left side, you see a scheme, the groundwater plant, the river Limmat coming from the from Lake Zurich is uh, feeding the groundwater field and we are taking actively by riverbank filtration uh, the water out of the limit. And I knew the values of intercoca in the limit quite well. So I thought I will, I will test uh, river water, raw river water and filtered uh, river water and drinking water. So, yeah, basics tests, cleaning efficiency. Uh, I took river water raw, measured it with enter alert. We had more or less 24 uh, per 100 mil. And drinking water was around zero uh, on the Kohli minder and also zero with enter alert. And then I just measured uh, high sample, low sample, high, hot, low. And as you can see, yeah, uh, the cleaning efficiency works quite well. All the drinking water samples were uh, near to zero or even a little bit uh, below because uh, the offset at the beginning, the water was not as, <laughs> as clean as the drinking water in our house. But uh, as a next step, I made a fractionation of the surface water samples because in these rivers you have uh, some bigger and smaller particles. And then you can see on the left, uh, uh, left image a cutoff with 45 micrometer. River water gave uh, a little bit more scatter than uh, the cutoff at 7 micrometer, so below. Seven micrometer, it was quite reduce, uh, reproducible, the measurement. And I got around uh, eight to nine uh, most probable numbers from the enter alert uh, test. So I did these things on different days, uh, but uh, more or less in a week and then in another week. I did some uh, dilution tests to find the limit of detection for my samples. Uh, I worked on the left side, you can see with river water uh, below seven micrometer. So this was a new sample, newly, um, newly fractionated and it was not steered. You have gas activity of up to 160, um, 160 units. And this gave with the enter alert test 165, so quite a high number of enterococci in this sample. Then I diluted this sample with drinking water. So this means uh, the right uh, on the right side, the 5% river water uh, below uh, 7 micrometer. Also this more or less with 7.5 MPN per 100 milliliter. Uh, was uh, correct, as I could see. And then I even diluted the sample, uh, another sample uh, to 1.25% river water and 98.75% uh, <laughs> drinking water. And you see, I came then to below one to one. <laughs> most probable number in 100 mil. So I really was uh, satisfied about uh, these results because I was not able to do that 10 years ago with uh, the former uh, instrument for, Cody, uh, for uh, E. coli at that time. But with this enterococci, I must say, yeah, it really has the same sensitivity as the as the enter alert test. So to see uh, how high, uh, which, which are the values in our distribution nets, I took some samples from different uh, fountains and measured the gas activity with this Kohli minder. 
And as you can see on the left side scale uh, is zero point something. <laughs> so that means, yeah, that must be some near to the, yeah, to zero. So absolutely no um, enzymatic activity. And that's uh, already the whole story. I can say take home messages. Uh, the prefiltration and the constant steering of surface water batch samples lead, lead it to more reproducible results. And the gas activity measurements with Coliminder are as sensitive as measurements with an enter alert test. And I was really happy about that because that can be done in, in much less time and uh, in, in a or with a very small sample volume confront, confronted to the normal test. I think the offset uh, recalibration with sterile filtered water is recommended to do often if measuring is to be carried out in the vicinity of the detection limit because uh, this seems to me uh, the biggest problem if you measure near to the detection limit with the daily performance or the offset uh, it can be more difficult to measure samples with low to near zero uh, values and uh, i thank you for your attention and i'm happy to hear some questions So thank you very much, Oliver. That's very nice. Um, if I may, I would like to insert a question which is from the previous discussion, but mm -hmm. came when you already started. Um, that question was, um, I think, more addressed to Wolfgang. Um, can you differentiate between animal or human fecal contamination? Mm, no. It's the short answer. The reason is what we measure is an enzyme. We measure the enzyme in case of E. coli, e. coli reagent. We measure the enzyme of beta-glucronidase. And we only, the measurement itself is specific to the enzyme itself. And it's not, it is specific for E. coli as the enzyme is specific for E. coli. And of course, it's the same E. coli or the same beta gluconidase, uh, even if it's uh, fecal uh, contamination from humans or from uh, animals, for instance. But with our measurement, we produce additional measurement results. One is uh, the transmittance of the sample, and the second is own fluorescence of the sample. And you, if you measure a uh, surface water and you have see a peak of E. coli contamination or beta-gluconidase contamination and this peak comes with an increase of own fluorescence of the sample then it's most likely from a sewage plant because there's a lot of fluorophore coming down with the discharge of a sewage plant. If it's from a, a, a yeah, agriculture then uh, there is no reason why there should be an increase of fluorophore uh, because there's no washing agents and whiteness in, uh, in in agriculture. So there, we can provide some information about that, but definitely the answer to the question is no, we unfortunately cannot determine between uh, human and animal source. So now time for more questions to Oliver Köster. Thank you, Wolfgang. So I think we could um, continue like this if any question comes to your mind in between. I'm happy to sort of address it after after the next presentation. I, um, ah, there is one question. How can we use online in production, for instance? I think that also addresses more to Wolfgang. Um, online in production, so the machine can be installed at a certain spot. All you need to make sure is that the machine has access to representative 
sample which is unpressurized. If you have a pressured uh, supply system, drinking water, for instance, then we offer add-on modules to depressurize the sample flow. And from that unpressurized flow, the machine is automatically taking sample. Uh, if you use that approach, you can even activate sample tube cleaning. So after each individual measurement, the sample, not only the collimander, but also the sample tube until the tip of the sample tube will be cleaned. And what you measure is actually only the, only and strictly the microbial quality or the uh, enzymatic activity present in the sample itself. Hope that helps. Any further questions to Mr. Köster? In case there aren't, feel free to post it during the next presentation, which will be held by Jean-Baptiste Bernet. Welcome here, Jean-Baptiste. Um, Jean-Baptiste obtained his PhD from the University of Liège in Belgium before carrying out a postdoc stay at Polytechnic Montreal in Quebec in Canada. And since 2020, he has returned to Europe and is now working as a R&D uh, research and technology associate at the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology. And his research has so far been focusing on source water protection, quality monitoring in a context of safe drinking water supply. Um, during rec his research day in Quebec, uh, Jean-Baptiste implemented automated online monitoring of microbial contaminants in drinking water supplies, as well as recreational waters. And he also actively contributed to the global efforts on SARS-CoV-2 surveillance through wastewater monitoring, both in Quebec and in Luxembourg. And I'm happy to open the stage for you. Welcome, Jean-Baptiste. Thank you, Ibeda, for the kind introduction. Hello everyone, um, I'm happy to present these uh, results from now several years already. I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can okay, see. Thank you, Wolfgang. <laughs> Okay, so um, this work actually has been done, uh, as you said, in, in Montreal, Polytechnic Montreal. So it's, yeah, I wanted first to acknowledge all my, um, uh, the person have been working with me, the many students, but essentially also uh, Sarah Donner and Michel Prévost, who I work with, who are uh, having these uh, research chairs and uh, in drinking water and in source water protection and now all the funding institutions also who enabled that work. Also Pierre Servet from, from Brussels, who was a pioneer in Glucuronase activity and enzymatic activity measurements uh, years ago, and also um, Manuel Avillon from Quebec for pathogen monitoring. So I'm going to talk today a bit about what we did with the Collimander. With this, this adventure started back in 2015 when I met Wolfgang at the IWA uh, conference in, in, in Lisbon. And so we started actually measuring with Collimander in 2016, and we did a validation study in 2017. After that, we deployed uh, several collimanders uh, in the greater Montreal area to monitor raw water coming into the drinking water treatment plants. So it was uh, surface water essentially. Um, and for 2.5 years, that was the longest monitoring at one intake. Um, so what I'm going to show today. And after that, we also, based on this monitoring of glucuronidase activity, we, we conducted event-based sampling for other parameters to, to better assess the risks at these drinking water intakes. Um, so we first wanted to to make sure the performance was adequate, and we were actually measuring uh, real, uh, reliable uh, things with this uh, new uh, instrument. So we compared also with different uh, methods. Uh, and the inter interesting thing is that it's involving the same enzyme. So it's the glucuronidase activity, uh, which is measured by both the collimander and also the culture-based methods, which is here Collilert, who everyone knows, and then one semi-automated method, which is TECTA. Uh, now I think it has been bought by, by um, IDEX. And basically it's the same enzyme which is involved and, and generating fluorescence, which is detected by the respective instrument. Um, but the timing of course is very different as already introduced by Wolfgang, which is, as there is no culture step involved with Collimander, it's much quicker. I'm not going to go into details in this because 
has been already explained. So back, coming back to these um, reputability measurements, we did some reputability measurements with uh, always six replicate measurements for the same sample. As you can see, samples with uh, increasing here uh, E. coli load, which was determined by culture-based uh, method. And we have here different methods, so the Collimander detector, and then two culture-based methods, the MPN method, and then the really the agar plate method. And you can see uh, that the coefficient of variation of these six replicates was much higher, of course, for the different methods we use. So it was very repeatable uh, when we measured with Collimander uh, these uh, samples with increasing E. coli loads. So that was already a good uh, indication. Then we uh, took three different instruments and we deployed them at one of the Dimic water gene plant intakes. And um, we measured then the same water for a while um, during, uh, for hourly measurements. Um, so that's what we achieved. It was also really repeatable between the three devices. You see the three different colors and with an average co coefficient of variation of 3.5%, which is really uh, repeatable, of course. Then we uh, compared this with GRAB samples that were collected along this time series with the Kolimada, which is always here represented in, in, in gray in the background. And here we have Collilert and then the other methods. And you can really see with the error bars that the, 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 the standard deviation, of course, for three replicates of for these different methods is much higher than when you measure with the Kolimada, the enzymatic activity. So it was also very uh, giving us, again, an indication about the reproducibility of this measurement in surface water. Here's also with qPCR that we measured uh, these grab samples. So having this, uh, we also tested different things, but you can read this in, in, in the paper we published uh, back then. Um, then we, we, we took uh, one device and we implemented uh, this monitoring during 2.5 years at one drinking water treatment plant intake. It's an urban river that is affected by different uh, untreated and treated sewage releases. As you can see here, the time series of the gluconase activity during that period. But we really see here a seasonal effect that during fall and winter and also spring, because in Quebec there is snow melt, you will see these contamination peaks appearing. Uh, whereas in summer, it's much more uh, calm. So contamination peak will really from fall to snow melt period. But then we, if we look a bit closer to uh, one period here in 2017, which is snow melt and, and rainfall, Here's again this time series, this, this zoom here. Um, you can really see, what's really interesting to see is that when we compare with this routine monitoring done by the utility, here in green dots are the E. coli measured every week, three to four times a week. You can really miss this uh, contamination peaks that you can detect with the, the gluconidase activity measured by Collimander. And if we then collect along this, for instance, peak with gluconase activity, and we collect E. coli with an auto sampler every hour here in black, and we measure this by the same method as a standard method, we really see how E. coli is increasing due to uh, intermittent peaks of contamination. So when you look, uh, that was a, of, uh, that was from Sunday, during Saturday night. <laughs> so that was really in the weekend. So we, we had completely missed it with standard monitoring. So we can see that there is more than one log increase in E. coli uh, between uh, before the event and at the peak of this uh, event. And the same here, almost, almost one log increase in E. coli. So uh, just also to explain, these peaks were triggered by rainfall uh, that has uh, caused discharges of sewage overflows and also sewage treatment plant bypasses upstream. And these rainfall, uh, which will follow following a rainfall, uh, sorry, and snowmelt, uh, snowmelt, yeah, snowmelt were followed by rainfall. These triggered actually the sewage releases, which then triggered these uh, intermittent contamination peaks in E. coli. So driven by snowmelt and rainfall, which is then causing sewage releases. We can also read this more in detail in our in our paper. There is more more descriptions and other uh, events described. So given this, when we see these intermittent peaks, we said, okay, we could also dig a bit more into it and, and look what is can be found other than E. coli during those peaks. Do we find also pathogens? And is it possible to design smart sampling strategies uh, using such an online method like the Collimander to target more specifically uh, events that all of, know, of us who know, who are going to the field and who know 
how difficult it is to, to target these intermittent events and how also how much logistic you need. And if you can have a kind of a guide to, 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 to target those periods and help us uh, um, sample for pathogens, that would be much more efficient. So we designed actually with um, VWMS, we designed a new model and they designed it, but we tested it. Uh, a new model module enabling to come to um, to enable the communication between an auto sampler and Colliminer. So the Colliminer is triggering the auto sampler uh, above a certain threshold for, for gluconeas activity, for instance. And then we collected high volume samples to detect um, protozoan pathogens, cryptosporidium and giardia um, in the surface water. I can see here one example. Uh, we, there is again a sewage release uh, caused by intense rainfall. So again, a very intermittent uh, rainfall, uh, sorry, in contamination event shown by orange here, gluconeus activity. And you can see the triangles in gray before at the peak and after the event is Giardia. So Giardia is really increasing more than uh, one, even two logs increase in Giardia during that specific contamination event. It was actually at, at uh, an urban beach uh, that we measured this. And um, so you can really see how with this uh, high resolution uh, monitoring, you can target specific events that you would not be able to target otherwise. Um, so uh, now, at least, I'm, again, we'll continue to work with Collimander and also other technologies and um, also want to go more into the drinking water um, part of the drinking water supply chain. I was measuring melodium surface water now more in the drinking, drinking water network. And here, as Wolfgang explained, there is another enzyme that can be used for total activity. I mean, alkaline phosphatase. And um, the idea here would also be uh, to, um, based on here, it's just an example to show you, based on the previous slide that I showed uh, on, on event sampling, you, we, we could be also then use this methodology of smart sampling to conduct event sampling in drinking water. If we detect a peak with ALP activity, we could then try to sample here and assess the sanitary risk for, for instance, cultural E. coli or other parameters. So that's an ongoing work we are conducting here. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I think be a really useful tool to better understand what's happening in the network in general. So just my take home message, I don't know if I have a lot of time left, but we validated uh, and then we deployed also a long term the automated cruise activity monitoring by Colliminder. It was in a drinking water supply in Quebec. Um, we showed the high repeatability of the measurements uh, in surface water, which enabled us also then to really well characterize really well the temporal scale of variation, so from seasonal to really event uh, of events of several days to several hours in that supply. And using this knowledge, we, we also identified pollution peaks unseen by routine monitoring uh, conducted by the utility. Based on that, we designed new smart sampling methodology for, for pathogen sampling. And then we also uh, sampled for other parameters, which are not shown here, uh, for also microbial source trackers, for instance, and that could be used for other parameters uh, that could be useful for the end user. With that, I would like to thank you um, for your attention. And I take just uh, two minutes to also advertise an event that we are organizing on December 6th, at least in Belvaux. It's called the Microbial Census for Water. And we are then having uh, talks with um, transversal, um, it's a transversal event with enzymatics, with polyminder, of course, but also with flow cytometry, ATP metry, and other technologies. There are a lot of different speakers from uh, Europe. And uh, anyone interested can join. It's uh, only on, on physical attendance. Uh, so we are looking forward to, to see you there. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very, very much, JB, for this insightful presentation. I have two more questions, um, which has just been raised. Just a second. Oh, I lost the Q&A. So I, I'll just read it by order. Um, are there any high profile adopters of the Cooley Miner technology? For example, any water companies using Cooley Miner to monitor measure bacteria? I think this question mostly goes to Wolfgang. Well, yeah, there are several customers. I mean, that's something you could also, when, when I got it right, then uh, yes, we have customers like uh, drinking water plants, like the water supply department in Hong Kong, 
who are using the Colimindo to monitor uh, the microbiological biological quality of their final drinking water. At the same time, they use the same device to also monitor the incoming water, water in parallel. So, and we have several uh, producers uh, like beverage producers, bottling companies. Uh, if if this was, if I understood the question correctly. Thank you, Wolfgang. And there is another question I think that would go also to Oliver Köster. Do you see a correlation between presence of enterococci in the river water and the produced drinking water? Uh, I didn't look at that with the Coley Minder, but in our uh, long-term database, yeah, we have uh, high values after heavy rainfall in the river limit and in the bank filtrated water, then you will sometimes also find a breakthrough of enterococci and E. coli. And you could do this monitoring with such a coal mine. I'm pretty sure, yeah. But we didn't do that in the last 10 years, so there are not so many breakthroughs. <laughs> To the bank filtrate maybe one to two times in a year it happens thank you oliver um any questions to jean baptiste so let's continue as we did before any questions posted during the next presentation will be answered after that one and I am really, really pleased to welcome Dr. Sophie Henn from Eau de Paris. Um, Sophie has been an engineer at Eau de Paris in the R&D team for over 16 years and working only on microbiological captures for the water quality, not only uh, on the microbiological captures for water quality in raw waters and produced tap water. She is especially involved in the Paris 2024 the Olympic Games for the monitoring of the Seine River quality. And I'm really happy to have you on board. And thank you very much for presenting your information now. The stage is yours, Sophie. Okay, thank you very much. Just trying to... Um, my screen. Is it okay for you? Yes. Do you see my screen? Yes, yes. yes. I see it, okay. but it's not in presenter mode, just so you know. Oh, okay. Um, just click the presentation. Yeah. It's, it's now yeah. the, not the presentation mode, yeah. Okay, is it okay for you? We still see all the individual slides. Okay. I. This one is okay. <laughs> Yes, that's working no, perfectly. Perfect. Thanks very much. Perfect. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So um, uh, we I will talk about the detection of microbiological contamination due to wastewater in the Seine River uh, using uh, Collie Mine. So uh, just uh, a little part about Haute Paris. Uh, Haute Paris is the tap drinking water producer for the town of Paris. And uh, we use 50% uh, uh, of the water, of the drinking water is produced uh, using spring water. And 50% uh, is uh, produced using surface water. So uh, Seine River and Marne River. So here you have a little, uh, you have the localiz localization of the Haute Paris network. So uh, on the left side, you have, and the south, you have the springs used for uh, the production. So they, they, they are far away from Paris, uh, nearly 100 kilometers far away. And uh, you have the two um, drinking uh, um, water treatment plants uh, on the Marne River, you have Joinville, and on the Seine River, you have uh, Orly. 
and uh, we first uh, our, we began to work with Colliminder in 2019 on the Canal de la Villette, and we used E. coli reagent. And uh, after that, we tried uh, Colliminder on the, the um, on tap water treatment plant of Joinville. So here you have a little uh, following uh, what we did. So in gray, you have the Colliminder uh, uh, values, in red, the lab values, and in blue, uh, the rain. Because in the Paris area, we have um, a unitary network. So the rain goes into the sewage. So uh, when, it's rain, when it rains a lot, we know that we have a a degradation of the quality of the of the water and um, so we use Colliminder mainly to follow the quality of water resource because uh, we use this resource to to make our uh, drinking water and uh, after that we used Colliminder to monitor the same quality for another purpose for uh, swimming because uh, as you know um, we have the Olympic Games next year, and uh, the town of Paris wants to have what they called a uh, heritage bathing scheduled for 2025. So they want to have uh, bathing areas for the Parisians. So that's why we use a lot of the, the Collie Minders. So here you have the, um, the Orly. Um, drinking water treatment plant. So Orly is uh, on the Seine River. You have here the a little location. So you have uh, on the, it's in the south of, uh, of Paris. And um, Orly is, is a little bit, um, has a strange localization. On the, on the right side, you have the Seine River. In blue, uh, the direction of the, of the flow, of the water flow. In, in blue here, you have uh, the, the treatment plant. And between the, the treatment plant and the Seine, we have what we call uh, une darse. It's, it's a kind of intake lake. So this lake, um, in this lake, we have two days of production. Water needed for two days of production. So when we have uh, a pollution uh, coming uh, through the Seine, uh, we can close the doors, the pumps between the sand and the intake lake, and uh, we manage to continue to produce uh, drinking water without uh, taking in the sand. And just uh, in in um, here up here on the other side of the sand, uh, we have um, um, up here um, we have a wastewater treatment plant just uh, before our uh, treat drinking uh, treatment plant. So in 2021, between the 20th and the 24th of April, uh, they had works on this wastewater treatment plant and all the sewage will go direct to the Seine upstream of our drinking treatment plant. So for, uh, upstream of Orly. During, uh, during two, three, three and a half days. So we knew it before. <laughs> so we, we stopped the connection between the intake lake and the sand. And, uh, we wanted to follow the quality of the sand using the collie minders to know when we can open, uh, our, uh, pumps again and to use the, the sand to, to use uh, the intake lake. So here uh, you can see the installation of, uh, of the Collie Minder. The Collie Minder was Archer. It was the, the first one we, we, we landed. So he was in uh, his little, um, little canister. He was uh, <laughs> uh, outside and uh, with the um, um, water and uh, wastewater, everything. And we had, we can see here on the left side, the, the, um, um, the Paris uh, pump system because uh, we were far away from, from the Seine. 
So the inside pump was a little bit too low. So we used another uh, another pump uh, to to get the um, the the water. And uh, so here you can see uh, what we we obtained. So in in red you have the collimander va values, and um, in blue you have the lab uh, lab results. So uh, we just used um, E. coli reagents, but I think if we if we had used uh, Enterococcus reagent, the, it will have been the the same. The, the um, in blue to have the lab measurements and they were done only once a day. And the collimator was working uh, every uh, two uh, twice an hour, so every uh, thirty minutes. So, uh, and you you can see that. Um, so in the we have um, um other captors on the before the intake lake and we have uh, we saw that uh, the collimander uh, saw the pollution before the NH4 detector that was based on site and uh, it allows to monitor the real flow because uh, between the 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 blue point points and the red line you can see a difference we saw uh, the real flow of the the pollution so we saw that after between the 20th uh, of April and uh, the 30, 30, uh, well, 34th of April, the um, quality is good enough to open the intake lake and to pump into the, the stand again. So in our case, um, Coriminder was helpful in case of pollution in the in the river. And it permits to monitor sharply the flow of the po pollution and uh, 24 hours uh, of 24. You need to to have uh, people in the lab uh, doing um, a microbiological um, uh, analyzes uh, even at night. So that's why <laughs> Coliminder is very very useful. So thank you very much. And if you have questions. Don't hesitate. Merci beaucoup, Sophie. Thank you, schön. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Um, there is actually a question um, to Jean Baptiste, which arrived in the meantime. Um, ah, okay. I see that uh, JB is already uh, answering that question in the chat. So I have a question uh, to Sophie. What is the sampling frequency that is usually used for Kulimander sampling? Or maybe to all of the speakers, I would like to address that one. Um, for for uh, It depends. Here we had a, a pollution. So we made um, a sampling each uh, twice an hour for uh, when we working on uh, the Sand River, for uh, example, the the test events were made uh, in last year for the Olympics. We had uh, sampling each uh, two hours, but during the the tests, uh, we are working uh, twice twice an hour. Maybe I may add that we usually recommend to our customers. For instance, if it's a process or something where they don't know, have no. Uh, insights about the dynamics the microbial the dynamics of the microbial contamination to start with a high frequency to evaluate what the dynamics of the respective applications are and as soon as the dynamics is known uh, sufficient time resolution can be chosen that would allow to really replicate what's going on in the system without wasting let's say reagents or measurements in general the higher the measurement frequency the higher the better the picture the sharper the picture it's like if you if you have a more sharp focus on what's going on in the system so any further questions to sophie i just see a question popping in oh no it was just a comment 
Um, as always, feel free to repost and post again to any of the speakers if you have any specific questions. Um, yeah, thank you very much again, Sophie, for your presentation. You. And as we have been doing our journey from uh, UK through Austria, Switzerland, now France and uh, Luxembourg, we're also happy to have someone from Scandinavia here in the person of Markus Freud. Um, Markus is actually a PhD in microbiology and works as a project manager at Sweden Water Research, mainly with questions related to water quality and monitoring of this one. His team has already tested the cooling man in a wide range of situations in the utilities test beds. And they also collaborated regarding the Kohli Manda with a project working on water quality monitoring of urban bathing waters called Urbana Bad. I hope I pronounced it in the right way. Perfect. Um, so happy to open the stage for you, Markus. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Let's see if I can get my screen shared so we can start. Does that look correct to you all? It does. All good. Perfect. Well, uh, thanks again. Uh, as Isabel said, I, my name is Marcus Freyd. I'm a project manager at Sweden Water Research. And I am here to talk a little bit about our experience with the Cold Reminder. But before I get into that, I would like to thank not only Isabel, but also the organizers, Natalie and, and the IWA Young Water Professionals United Kingdom for hosting this session today and for, for organizing this very nice event this afternoon. So Sweden Water Research is a research and development company owned by three local water utilities in the southwest part of Sweden. And our water utilities are in turn comprised of municipal owners. So NSVA is owned by the municipalities marked in red, Veasid, the ones in blue, and Seidvatten, the ones that are stripy. So you can see that we cover not only three utilities, but a very large geographic area of this part of Sweden. And that also means that Sweden Water Research has very wide interests when it comes to research and development from the water utility sector. We work with everything from the raw water sources, in our cases, mainly fresh uh, surface waters. And uh, <clears throat> we work all the way to the sewage treatment and, of course, the recipients. And I would like to share the story of how we came into contact with the Coley Minder a few years back. And that was via a project called Shelby, jumping ahead here, Shelby Water Workshop. So this is a testbed project for innovation of water quality monitoring solutions for the water utility sector. And together in this project, we actually represent test beds for drinking water, recycled wastewater, and raw water sources. So we have a really wide range of interests. And because of this collaboration, we could really widen our perspectives when it comes to water quality monitoring and capitalizing on potential synergies between monitoring different water types and the quality thereof. And here the Coley Minder became quite interesting because it had a wide range of potential applications and it could monitor many different things with one device. And that is why we chose to, to rent the Coley Minder. Uh, so we had two instruments in this project for roughly six months. And we also managed to try the emergency response unit, so the portable version within this uh, project. This project is funded by the Swedish Innovation Agency from 2021 to 2024. And it's our water utilities and of course, Sweden Water Research that partake in this project. So that's how we started working with it. And within the frame of that project, we tried the Kolleminder in as many positions as we possibly could cram into the test period. We have wide interests, so we really sent it all around our utilities, our test beds. We tested it on water intake to our waterworks. We tested it on our lake, uh, which is one of our main uh, sources of our drinking water. We tested it on recirculated gray water, drinking water. We did comparison studies with other technologies we had on hand at the time. And we also monitored sewage recipient ponds. So we have small scale pilot studies of all of this, and I'd be happy to discuss uh, with you all at another time. But unfortunately, uh, we don't have time to go into all of this. And I would actually like to talk uh, for the rest of this um, discussion about a collaboration we did with another project altogether. So we have a, another project that's Sweden Water Research that is related to bathing water quality monitoring. And because of the, the collaboration between Shelby Water Workshop and this project, we could actually start to monitor the bathing water quality in recreational waters because there they had a big interest in enterococci and E. coli presence uh, 
And the coliminder, as you've heard many times before today, can measure the presence of these particular bacteria. So Ubonabad is the project that uh, I will now talk about, and that is the project focused on bathing water quality in specifically urban areas. And as I'm sure you can all appreciate, closing a beach or recreational water source in these uh, uh, urban areas is a very costly and time-consuming issue with very large impacts on tourism, on recreational value for local residents. And there is a big need for to monitor recreational water quality in more efficient ways. The current sampling is, as previously described this afternoon, quite time consuming. You send away your sample, you wait for the laboratory results. If you find contaminants, you have to shut down your beach and then you have to wait several days to open it back up. So the whole process can take up towards a week. And that is of course a big problem if you have very short transient events and you want to reopen your beach as soon as possible. So in this project, there has been a twofold approach. Uh, they have been working with source tracking measures. So to find where are the contaminants coming from and how can we avoid or mitigate these sources in the future? And of course, having good data to correlate uh, with other things, such as the you know having data on the presence of Enterococca and E. coli can be correlated to other data, and that can of course help us with the source tracking. And of course, working on an early warning system for bathing water quality. And the goal here is of course uh, to minimize the closures of beaches, not just the amount of them, but also the time frame, so that you can open them faster after a closure when the quality is actually good again, if you happen to have these problems. And this is a very nice collaborative project between our water utilities, NSVA, Veasud. You have our municipal cities, Helsingborgstad and Malmöstad, and of course, our collaborators at Lund University, and of course, Sweden Water Research. And here I'm just showing you a Google Maps picture of the region. And the northern arrow points to the rough installation site in, in 2022, where we had two coli miners measuring the bathing water quality in Helsingborg. And in 2023, we continued that work. Uh, I have since joined the project formally, so I'm actually a part of Ubonabad nowadays. Um, it's no longer in collaboration with Shelby Water Workshop because uh, 2022 was quite successful. And in 2023, we also included a measurement site in Malmo. And we used two uh, coal miners in the 2022 testing and three in the 2023 testing. But I'm sure you can all appreciate that we are a peninsula and we also have the Danish coastline on the other side. This is a heavily populated region. <laughs> we just heard from Paris, so comparatively, maybe not. But for our local, local population centers, this is a big one. And of course, there's huge recreational value of the waters in the Øresund Strait between Denmark and Sweden. So I would like to show you some pictures from the installation in 2022. It's a bit different from, say, a water treatment plant or something like that. This is a year-round bathing facility built on stilts in the Øresund Strait. Uh, it's a roughly four-meter drop down to the water, but they were generous enough to offer up one of these booths for the installation of our monitoring solutions. So we got the Coliminder and some other devices installed during the summer of 2022. We have some very happy teammates from Shelby Water Workshop helping with the technical installation. You have uh, our PhD student uh, in the top right corner working with the Coliminders, and she's now in charge of collecting and analyzing all of the data generated over these years. And then, of course, a very happy group of people, including our project manager, who uh, have a finalized installation in 2022. But this is just an example of what it can look like. And this is also a very peculiar installation because every site will be different. Not every bathing site in the Scanian coast will have access to such a great facility. So you need to be a bit flexible in an installation. But here, the Coliminder worked out very nicely. And of course, here, we also need a pump solution to bring non-pressurized water to, to the device. But I would like to talk about data, not so much about the specific results that I will leave to the PhD student, Isa, who will, I'm sure, be happy to present this in a couple of years when she's finished with it and has published on it. But I would like to talk about the amount of data we generate. So we represent cities and municipalities, and we're not really used to handling this type of quality data when it comes to recreational waters. And this is, of course, a problem that comes again and again when you're working with modern microbiological techniques. So you can see the periods in which we measured and how many measurements were made with each of the reagents, E. coli and enterococci measurements. And it's between 589 and 889 different uh, samples taken depending on site and year. And this is to be contrasted with a normal sampling, which of course was running parallel with all of this. And this is 16 samples, give or take, during the period. So once per week per site. And it's a pretty big difference in handling and analyzing data from 16 samples versus, say, 800. And one other interesting thing about these numbers is that, of course, we aimed to do 1,000 measurements on each site. 
this is the <laughs> this is not just a nice round figure. It's also the volume in which Coleminder delivers their reagents in this case. So of course we want it to be cost efficient and get to the thousand measurements for each of the periods. But this underlines the difficulty of such an installation, especially when you're new and trying things out and piloting a project. Uh, there are very strange challenges that occur when you're not in your own uh, water utility locales anymore. You're out and about in real life. You run into power outages, storms, broken pumps, et cetera, et cetera. And this really highlights the need for planning and maintenance regimens for any installation that is uh, sort of in the more exotic area. Me coming from drinking water, this was a big thing for us to handle. But I'm sure that you can all also appreciate that we actually increased the number significantly from 2022 to 2023. And that really shows that you can improve this very rapidly when you have experience and hands-on understanding of what you need to do to make each individual site work well. So it becomes a very powerful system that generates a lot of data for us to bring forward into this project and analyze further. So in the last minute, I would like to just highlight what is next for this project. Of course, it's very attractive to make this data available to the public. So all of our residents who want to go swimming, can we give the, this type of information about the quality in real time to these types of visitors in the future? That would, of course, be very nice to evaluate moving forward. And of course, the big challenge that ESA is now facing, how do we understand this data? What parameters correlates to the E. coli presence and Torcoca presence or both? And how can we use this to help us in our goal to really find the sources of the contaminants? Because it's not very clear where they're coming from. And it's a, there's a lot of different parameters that can play in. Rain, wind, combined sewer overflows, animals in the nearby vicinity, bathing guests themselves, perhaps. We don't really know the sources of these contaminants in all of the cases, and we're really try to find a better way of handling it and the Coleminder can help us there. So I would like to highlight that it's very important to keep working towards the source tracking part as well as the monitoring solutions because the information they can feed to each other will really help us moving forward. And with that, I would like to thank you all for the attention. If you have questions, I'll happily take them. You can of course contact me later on as well or read more about our projects on the webpage. Thanks. <laughs>